service is miles in front of Argentina. Well, I was only I was only using that as a scenario. Well, I asked you, Peter, in what way was this country behind Argentina? You chose to say, amongst other things, health. Well, that is utter nonsense. Well, yes, of course. Totally, it is. Just... utterly nonsense. As is the case in education. The education system in this country is far superior to that in Argentina. Yeah, where, but it's not where superior to, to other countries. Well, you picked Argentina. If you meant other countries, you should have pronounced it differently, like China or Yugo Pigin Slavia. But what you said was Argentina, you gormless prat. You have been besicked. This weekend, bring the family to Fleetwood and Cleveland and have a great day out in the Y Resorts with beautiful beaches, picturesque villages, lots of seaside attractions, and would you believe it, free car parking. At the Marine Hall Fleetwood, the ever-popular Old Time Music Hall with Tony Valance and Fred Barton every Wednesday at 8. And don't miss Ken Dodd's Laughter Show on Tuesday the 28th of July. For full details, ring Fleetwood 71141 now. Looking for something different this week? Come along to the spectacular Superdome at Morecambe's Leisure Park and see the stars in concert. Frank Carson, Derek Beatty, plus many, many more. There's always something different at the Superdome Morecambe. Phone our leisure line on Morecambe 424444 and find out who and what's on this week. Thinking of changing your hi-fi? Call into Lang Video Audio at Crumpton Street, Wigan and Nesley Street, Bolton, the North's leading part exchange hi-fi specialists. Ring Wigan 323-897 for details now. Free, yes, free! Unimark Car Security Marking this Saturday at Queen's Mill, Preston's one-stop all-in store with refreshments. This weekend on Channel 4 Television, listen out for an advert for Helmshaw Mill. Helmshaw Mill Museum. It's actually a textile museum. And you will find that the voice advertising Helmshaw Textile Museum is a rich, resonant, Lancashire voice of distinction. Not dissimilar to this one, I might add. How do David? Hi, Rowan. I've just been watching the ladies' cricket on Channel 4. Have you been watching it at all? No, I've not. Do you happen to know what the record is for the number of no balls in one cricket match? Uh, how about 22? 22 or 44? <laughs> Sir Good night. Nice game. How do Tony? Hello, oh, on. Uh, I want to talk about Lord Delphon's decision to ban animals from Blackpool Tower Circus. I mean, I think it's absolutely terrible. Why? Well, I've enjoyed circus ever since I was a child and... The animal acts are the things that have given me the most pleasure. Well, fine, I'm sure they have given you the most pleasure. If you say they have, who am I to argue? But we're bothered, or Lord Delphont and his cronies are bothered, about the protests, and the people doing the protesting are bothered about whether the animals have actually enjoyed it. Well, to quote Lord Delphont himself, uh, he's given in to a vociferous minority. Uh, I just said when that. I w when I go to circus, I enjoy the anim animal act, and I don't see any reason why my sh children should be denied the same enjoyment that I've had. Well, the answer is that we would like people to consider the animals first, see whether the animals like it, and I would imagine they don't. Well, the animals have always seemed perfectly happy when I've seen them. Uh, Lady Carroll, who is Lord Delphont's wife, who is a leading member of the RSPCA and the World Wildlife Fund, uh, also has stated publicly that the animals do not seem to suffer in any way whatsoever. The RSPCA disagree with her. Well, so, uh, she's a leading member of the RSPCA. She is entitled to her opinion, but not entitled to credence with that opinion. It's rather like that stupid prat, what's his name, Prince Philip, being the president of the World Wildlife Fund and then going out with a 12-bore shotgun and shooting birds. 
reprehensible, diabolical, two-faced garbage. Well, killing animals is one thing. Uh, Locking them up. Locking do, them. We, we, we're not, animals it isn't just is the training. Another. It isn't just the training. It's the conditions in which they have to live. Elephants chained to the wall. Elephants that can't be exercised properly. Animals that can't be given the freedom to move around. Animals that spend large sections of their life locked in a cage, eight foot by eight foot or whatever it is. That's what the complaint's about. The performance, we can talk about the performance. I, I would be prepared to hear an argument and understand an argument that some animals actually enjoy the performance. Some animals actually enjoy the training. One of the happiest animals I ever saw was a rag and bone man's pony. Absolutely blissfully happy horse. You knew it was happy. It always looked like it was smiling. But it was looked after. It had a decent life. It had all day in the streets. It had all night in a decent stable with good food because it was a guy's bread and butter. All the time it was looked after. So it had a good life. Nothing wrong with work. Nothing wrong with work at all. But it's where you live. And according to all the campaigners and indeed the RSPCA, the conditions that the animals at the Tower Circus are kept in are abominable. Now that's what the complaint's about. Not the little bit of work they do in the ring an hour every day or whatever it is, but where they have to live. Well, surely that is not down to the trainer. I mean, it's a case of the camels two years ago where Blackpool Council no one is suggesting rights to exercise on the beach. No one is suggesting that it is the trainer's fault. It is the fault of circumstance. But if it's the fault of circumstance, then you have to consider improving that circumstance. Now, Black Bill Council have forbidden certain courses of action that could have improved the circumstance. Fine, you can argue with the council till you're blue in the face. It won't make any difference. They've made their decision. At the end of the day, you have to come down and say, are the animals kept in decent conditions, yes or no? The answer for a lot of people is no. Well, I honestly believe that the answer is not to ban the Animal Act, but to improve the conditions that the animals can live under then. The there are certain, ge not geographic, certain architectural limitations to that. It's very, very difficult. It's rather like, if you go into, and I've seen it, if you go into the Tower Aquarium, there is a conger reel there. It must be all of eight foot long. And its tank isn't bigger than that. It's not that much bigger than it. So what do you do for that? Build it a bigger tank? Where? Where do you put it? Oh, you leave it where it is. You leave it where it is so it can't move round. It yeah, can't move, it just lies there looking at you. It's damn cruel in my view. No, I don't, I don't agree with that. Well, think, OK, uh, you don't, don't agree with me, but they're, a lot they're, of people they're nothing, they're nothing more than animals when all said and done. Aren't well, oh, indeed they are, but then so are you and I. Yeah, but, I'll, well, I'll, I'll go along with animals should have the same rights as human beings the first time one rings you up and has a conversation with you. They're doing it all the time. You've never heard any of the Scousers. <laughs> Come well, on. Well, this guy is Scousers. <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> How do, Patrick? Hello. Yeah. Yes, turn your radio off. I'll come back to you after the break. It's the biggest summer sale of used tours in the northwest at Stuart Longton Caravans. And this month, with every used caravan, Stuart Longton is giving away a new awning, or you're welcome to a cash discount. First time buyers get £100 of equipment thrown in too. These offers are available this month only. So for your used tour plus free awning and equipment, move first to Stuart Longton Caravans, next to the railway station at Chapel Street Chorley, or at Stuart Longton Northwest on the A6 near Lancaster. Drive up the road for your holiday. I'll do line three. Don't be giving me all that garbage. As you can see, there are lots of poor imitations about. So make sure when you're looking for the ultimate window, patio, sun lounge or conservatory, you go to the company with higher standards, like heat efficient glass, large cavity, high security locks and a fully insured guarantee. Talk to Direct Windows and not the imitators. Deal direct with Direct Windows. Phone Preston 703-008. That's 703-008. Ashton Domestic. Ashton Domestic, Ashton Domestic, I clean up all the microwave, you're gonna say.
just now, there's up to £50 off selected Hot Point washing machines, washer dryers, fridges, dishwashers and vacuums, including the new Hot Point condenser washer dryer at only £379. See the full Hot Point range at Ashton Domestics, 474 Blackpool Road, Preston. Ashton Domestics. Call 726 416. Ashton Domestics. This Saturday from 9 till 12, the chart of Lancashire's favourites will be played on Lancashire's favourite station. The Red Rose Top 40 on Red Rose Radio, in association with Red Rose Kitchens of Moorbrook Street, Preston. Manufacturers of quality fitted kitchens and the number one kitchen for your home. The chart is compiled by computer every week from sales throughout the Northwest. Catch the Top 40 this Saturday at 9am and discover which songs being made number one by you. I'll do Nora. No, we're still doing Patrick. Nora's next. Hello, Patrick. Yeah, uh, you've just been all about uh, race relations and what have you. Do you not think that uh, Asians and that are ignorant? It depends what you mean by ignorant. Well, when, you, when you're talking to them and they've got another like, relation of theirs, uh, they'll talk to them in like their language. Well, they may have to. They may not have a choice. Yeah, but if they can talk in English. When you go abroad, I don't suppose it applies to you, but when I'm abroad, my partner is able to speak French. So when we go to France, my partner speaks in French to the people who are French. And then when she wants to address me, she speaks to me in English, because talking to me to, in French would be a complete waste of time, because I can't talk French. Yeah, Am I being, are, they be, are we being ignorant, then? No, but what I mean... Like, what do you mean? Because that's exactly this, the description you've just given of Asian and other ethnic people in our community. That is exactly the position you've just explained. Yeah, so why is it right for me to do it in France? Is that because I'm white and British? No, but if there's, right, say, three, say three Asians there, they can all talk English. Why don't we talk English and talk Why should Asian? they? Why should they? It's a free country. Or do you not want it to be free for brown people? Oh, I've never you don't want them. Well, why are you complaining then? It's a free country. Let them speak whatever language they wish. Yeah, but it's still ignorant, isn't it? No. Oh. Well, I think it is anyway. It may well be bad manners on well, certain yeah. on certain occasions. If you are involved in a conversation with them, and they continue that conversation in a foreign language, then of course that is bad manners. But if they're having a conversation that does not in involve you in a shop, on a bus or whatever, I don't think they should have to go into English so that you can eavesdrop. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, same, you know, I've worked with Italians and they'll be talking to me and it's um, a conversation and then they'll turn around to their, like, relations and start talking in Italian. And well, if, I'm, I'm in with the conversation. If their relations are able to speak English and you're involved in the conversation, then I think it is bad manners. But I don't think bad manners is limited to any racial group, be it Italian, Asian, Nigerian, English, Welsh. You won't get any worse manners than I sometimes display on this programme. <laughs> and I don't need help from another language. I can be rude enough in just English. Anyway, thanks for your call. How do you, Nora? Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Nora. Um, I wonder if you could clear something up for me. Yeah, I don't know. Um, what have you spilled? <laughs> Come <laughs> round with a brush. It <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about the water gate, <laughs> so yeah. I've not spilled the water. No. Um, there's the Watergate scandal and the Iran gate scandal inquiry yeah. going on at present. Why do they put the gate at the end? Right, well, there's... The Watergate isn't going on at the moment. It, no, it's no. It's been it, and gone. Uh, the original problem with the Watergate scandal, as it was called, was that the premises that were broken into... I see. ...with the authority of President Nixon mm -hmm. were some premises that were actually called Watergate. I see. So that's where the name came from. And now they just bong gate on the end of Iran Gate to yeah, draw well, attention that, to people. That's what it was well, that's just yeah. a nonsense. Just saying they had the big Watergate inquiry. It became known as the Watergate yeah. inquiry. And so some clever journalist somewhere has coined yeah, the phrase Iran Gate. There's no gate right. involved. It's just no, because I mean just a, here a, a when phrase. we had the perfumer, it was the perfumer affair, wasn't it? That's right. And we tend to use the affair. Affair. And indeed, it was called the Watergate scandal. That's right. Now. This is being called the Iran Gate 
scandal, scandal. simply because it's a nice, catchy way of getting it in the papers, I isn't see. it? It makes a nice headline. Uh-huh. Well, thanks Some very much. Some editor for somewhere has come it up, up with it. It's <laughs> right, been love. puzzling me. Right, bye, thank bye, you. Bye. I'll do David. I'll do Alan. Um, I think it's disgusting how they play so many repeats on television. Why? Well, we're paying all this money, and all we're getting is repeats that we've seen before. We're paying on the TV license. Well, that's not all you're getting. No, but, you know, a lot of programmes... Uh, nowadays, they're all repeats. What do you mean, a lot of programmes are all repeats? That sounds like a contradiction in terms to me. Some programmes are repeats, yes. Well, a lot of programmes. Yes, but not a large proportion. Certainly not the majority. Yes, but um, why do they have to keep repeating them all? The simple answer to that is the cost of making new programmes is prohibitive. So... If you were prepared to double the price of your television licence, you might be able to reduce the numbers of repeats by half. Oh, I see. Um, and also, I was wondering, what do you do in the melodic moment? I sit here like a divvy. Do you not have a cup of tea? Go, oh, yeah, I have a brew. Huh. Do you watch the television? No. Huh. If I'd have known ladies' cricket was on this evening, I would have done. <laughs> generally not. Well, why do you want to watch ladies' cricket? I like cricket. Huh. No, nothing to do with the ladies? Well, like, nothing to do with them at all. The last time I watched the Australian ladies cricket team was actually in Melbourne, many years ago, about six years ago. And they're not as good at cricket as men. They're not as fast at the bowling and the like, but it was quite enjoyable. Oh. But they all wear collots, so there's no, f there's no treats in it. <laughs> <laughs> all right? Right, thank you. Goodbye. And I don't blame them for wearing collots either. How do, Mike? Good morning, Alan. Morning. I'd like to talk about... Um, what the Forestry Commission are doing with uh, British moorland. Then talk about it. Then talk about it. Um, you may have noticed that the Forestry Commission are appropriating large stretches of moorland, particularly round Shap, Alston, Denby, and planting large quantities of conifers That's correct. on the moorland. Um, this creates in me something of a conflict because I believe that the moorlands are an amenity they're one of the few places where one can go and be away from the pressures of life that they're, 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 they're yeah. an open and deserted yes I accept that um, by the same token I accept that the forestry commission needs trees um, uh, I wondered what your feelings on this subject were. I have similar thing, feelings to yours in that, yes, it's the loss of an amenity, although, to be fair to the Forestry Commission, they do generally allow people access to the land, not always, but a lot of the time. Yeah. And obviously they respect rights of way and the like. My biggest complaint about the Forestry Commission is the damn trees they plant. They're so hideous. Yes, and they're dark and they're gloomy. That's right, reams and reams, miles and miles, acre upon acre. Why on I've can't got awful plant pine trees. Broadleaf deciduous trees. My. Some broadleaf deciduous Just a few would do, wouldn't it? Just a few, yeah. But I'm afraid, I don't know. I don't know what the reason is, except it's pure commercial stuff. But, I mean, it, once... I mean, the moorland... I, I, I don't like to see the moorland destroyed, even though accepting that the moorland is a man-made feature. I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of the moorland is only moorland because man nicked all the trees oh, yeah, a lot yeah, of years ago. Because, like, 8,000 years ago, some bunch of blokes came over across the channel and cut all the trees down. Um, but it would be possible to restore it, surely, to something like its former situation, uh, and, and surely it would be possible to leave some of the areas open more because well when the government starts dealing with its new land use policy maybe and i use that term and it's <laughs> advisedly maybe they'll actually encourage people to plant things other than yet more coniferous trees we'll have to wait and see i i don't know i think there will be some encouragement for people to to plant as you say broadleaf deciduous trees i don't think there will be much encouragement to be honest but i think there'll be some there are certain grants becoming available for farmers who are prepared to put their land over to timber 
and I don't think it would require a great deal of ingenuity on the government's behalf to encourage that timber to be broadleaf deciduous. Yeah, but when we're talking about farmers, we're talking about lowland arable areas. I mean, the moorlands are areas which have become, through man's activity, marginal or even totally unproductive areas. Um, they have become bleak and deserted due to man's activity, albeit many, many years in the past. Um, once the coniferous trees are established and the ecolog ecological structure of the moorland is changed back to woodland, it, it must surely be possible to move back to a, a broadleaf deciduous environment. It isn't easy once you've planted up acres of conifers to then plant deciduous trees in because the conifers block out all the sunlight and <laughs> nothing happens. The kind of woods that you see in our countryside, the, the mixed woods, are the perfect for Britain, but they've never been planted, they've just developed. It's very difficult to plant a wood like that. Yeah, I realise that. It actually really. takes generations of people to get the, if you like, the planting rotation correct. And the day this country, or the, the, the century this country, has the same policy for 30 years has yet to arrive. Yeah, I was up on Alston not so long ago and I was absolutely horrified at what they'd done in carving great swathes out of the peat. You know, these trenches, eight, ten foot deep, these drainage ditches and, mm. and massive areas of conifers. Um, I, as I say, I, I feel quite strongly that, that they all... What you should do is join the Ramblers Association and Friends of the Earth and campaign to get it stopped. All right? But I don't know if it should be stopped. I, I, I think... The, well, the some of it's got to be, hasn't it? Well, I think there should be some... Yay. How about controlled? Yeah, some controlled. OK. Well, join and campaign for that. How do Joyce? Hello, Alan. Yes. Um, I, I was just listening to the lady about talking about Asians. Yes. Um... Well, why are the English so lazy in, in speaking another language? The simple answer to that is because we're an island. If you lived in France or Germany, you would probably have at least a smattering that you've picked up naturally of your neighbour's language. But unfortunately in England we don't do that because we are so isolated and have for generations been so isolated from the continent. Should we ever get the Channel Tunnel, then perhaps that will change when people nip across the yes, continent. Yes, but a lot, a lot of the, the people in Holland and Amsterdam, they speak a lot of English. They yes, they do. They speak a second language. Yes, because they've, had, they've made the effort. The Continentals have a mixed language anyway. I mean, obviously yes. they have their own grammar and everything else. But most Continentals can speak... Most city continentals can speak more than one language. Yes. I'm not sure that that's the same in the countryside. Yes, but the English doesn't try to, well, you that, know, uh, learn answer, any language. The, sim the simple reason for that is, Joyce, that we're, we're an isolated island, and so we don't have that cross-fertilisation of language, as it were. Most people in France have been across, most city-type people in France have been across to other countries. The Germans travel around a lot. We tend to sit here and for generations have sat here and done sweet nothing about travelling unless we were out conquering. Yes, sir, I'm talking about the British Isles. Uh, I mean, I'm Welsh, OK? Yes. And um, if I talk any Welsh, I can hear English people saying, there's no need for that. <laughs> you know, as if uh, yes, they're talking mean. about them. And they're not. That's just because they're all paranoid, Joyce. You stick to your own language, love. You yeah, talk in Welsh whenever mean, you like. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that... Uh, and I go to a nation family, and they talk to me in English. But when they talk to their children, they talk in their own language. That's so it. that doesn't offend me at all. I should hope it doesn't. You know, so... We're just, we're just so pig-headed, we yeah, English. Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. And if people expect to go to France and expect them to talk English, I mean, that's ridiculous, because they should learn to, to talk uh, French if they go to France. Well, I go to France 
fairly frequently, about once a year, and I can't speak the damn language. No, but, but perhaps your wife can. Well, my partner certainly can, yeah. occasionally. Oh, All right, yeah. Joyce, thanks yeah. very much. Right. Please listen to my ditty. It may not be very witty, nor even slightly funny, but it will help save you money. For me, from cradle to grave, I aim to shop and save. I buy out, I need, for next and out indeed. There's meat and veg and cheese and picks and booze and clothes and cards and sweets and pigs and pet food and household things. So shop and save a load down Blackpool's Waterloo Road. In the market they call new and over at road the M2. Thank you. Poetry in prices from the new market and M2 market. It's the place to come where shopping can be fun. Direct Windows, the best way to buy UPVC windows and doors in Lancashire. We install the superb Bowwater Halo system, and all work is guaranteed and underwritten at Lloyd's of London. Buy direct, avoid the middleman, and make hard cash savings. Visit the new factory showroom seven days a week at 64 Red Scar Estate, Long Ridge Road, or phone Paul Kelly on Preston 703008. Deal direct with Direct Windows. Direct Windows. Hello there. I'm just having my HGV driving lesson with North Manchester HGV. They do hourly lessons and intensive courses to put you on the right road. If you're an HGV or PSV novice, for just £30 you can have a full two-hour assessment, including licence and medical fee. Now, if you pass with them, they'll guarantee you a job interview. So, what are you waiting for? Ring North Manchester HGV Training Centre on Bolton 23235. That's Bolton 23235. Hello, David. Hello, um, Alan. I wonder if you could give me a bit of advice, please. What about? Well, we live in rented accommodation, and the person that owns the accommodation has just died. And I just wondered how we stood, like, you know. On the information you've given me... Nothing changes. The no. estate is still entitled to the rent. It depends on what the estate wants to do with the property. Want to sell. They want to sell. Yeah. They will have some difficulty selling it with you as a sitting tenant. Are they making any attempt to get you out? No, they, they've not said that. But they've given us option to buy. Do you want to buy? Yeah, we do want to buy. Well, We've been in the accommodation now. Why don't now. you buy it then? Well, it, we've been in the accommodation uh, for five years. It's unfurnished. It's a flat. And um, but the thing is, when the person died, her son said that um, the rent that we've paid for the five years would come for the deposit for the house. You know, it's a house converted into two flats. So he's saying your five years' rent, if you wish to buy, your five years' rent would count as part the... Deposit. Well, the deposit's not his business. The deposit has nothing to do with him. He paid the deposit to the building society, not to him. Yeah, no, but that's what he said. Um, that'll do for the deposit for the building society. Well, he's, he's talking gibberish. It's none of his business. Isn't it? If oh. he's saying that that will count towards the overall price of the house, in other words, let us just assume that the flat you live in is 20,000 quid to buy yeah. and you've already spent 5,000 pound in rent, yeah. then he'll sell you it for 15,000. Yeah. No, and but it's a house converted into two well, flats. I was just giving that as an yeah. example. Yeah, I understand what you mean, yeah. So what he's saying is the money you've already paid will count towards the cost of the purchase yeah and of course when you go to the building site and they say how much money are you putting up you can say well we've already put five grand up in yeah. rent do yeah. you want to buy oh yeah we do want to buy but um since we seen the person like um about four days ago and he was talking that um he would like us to buy but since like the funeral was yesterday and we seen him today and he says, uh, nothing more to do with me, it's in the hands of my solicitor. Well, that's perfectly reasonable. What I suggest you do is get in touch with his solicitor and say, what are the conditions of purchase, what is the price, and then get it valued, get the property valued independently. Yeah. Get a full valuation on the property done independently. Yeah. And you can get a, a sale valuation just by calling an estate agent and saying, what would you get for this if we put it on the market? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Bye-bye. Are -bye. you Rachel? Hello. Hello. I think it's um, terrible how people cheat the insurance companies out of um, 
all the money with false false um claims I well think. i think it's terrible too but the insurance companies do a fair bit of cheating yeah but it's they those do. who have to pay for it in the long run indeed it is which is why i think it's terrible but the insurance companies are not the i don't have a lot of sympathy for them because they're such damned awkward and unfair organizations yeah okay okay cheers thank you this is it you are the best place to go you are the coach house diner is the one you'll want to know yeah this is steaks chicken fish salads pizzas pasta sandwiches whatever you fancy for lunch or dinner call into the coach house diner in litham five different eating areas and two exciting bars Plenty of room for everyone. The Coach House Diner, opposite the green on Henry Street, Lytham. The Coach House Diner, this is it. Thinking of changing your hi-fi? Call into Lang Video Audio at Crumpton Street, Wigan and Nesley Street, Bolton, the North's leading part exchange hi-fi specialist. Ring Wigan 323-897 for details now. Free, yes, free. Unimark Car Security Marking, this Saturday at Queen's Mill. Preston's one-stop, all-in store, with refreshments. How do, Garen? Hello, Alan. Um, I have the opinion that this country is backward in the fact that it doesn't provide sufficient means for children. Sufficient means for children to do what? I'll explain myself. Please do. Um, in Sweden, um, every parent is allowed 60 days per year off to nurse their sick children. Um, this is fully paid. Also, um, it is, uh, they provide creches, uh, government provided, um, for families to put the children in so they can go to work. Also, in Holland, the, what we have is the um, child benefit. In Holland, it is increased at the age of five, it is increased because they start school. When they go on to the senior school, it is increased again. And in this country, it, nothing's done. They don't seem to recognise the fact how that we have children. Well, they do. They, really. pay, they pay child benefit. But yeah, how but does the true. child benefit in Holland, at its maximum, yeah. compare with the child benefit in Britain? Oh, it's about four times as much. Mm -hmm. Maybe five. Yes, I, know, I actually know that to be the case. Yes, that is also is. the case in Belgium. Yes, it because is. Because yeah. I know some people that went to live in Belgium, and in fact, the mother of the family didn't have to draw any money at yes. all for like weeks. Yeah, well, of all I, this have money friends, she got. I have friends in Belgium, so, and they've just had a child, so, you know, that's how we found out. Indeed, but of course, in those countries, their welfare state is not always as good as ours. Indeed, people come from those countries to this country for our health services. Well, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't actually say that it's better because the uh, dole, as they hear, supplementary benefit, dole, um, you know, those two things. Um, over there, also the friends that I have, the family friends, um, that he became unemployed and his dole went on um, three times, uh, sorry, twice his last wage that he was earning. Mm -hmm. uh, this only went on for 12 months and then it was decreased by half and so on. You it know. went on twice his last wage? Yes, it did. So he actually got a pay rise for getting a sack? Yes. So wonder they're not all on the dole. Well, the, um, in, in Holland, um, the, well, the cost of living is you know, extortionate to what, to what ours is. So obviously, my husband's a merchant seaman and he was almost on his wages for, for doing nothing. I don't understand... A week. I yes. don't understand what benefit there is to be gained from paying somebody more money for being unemployed than you pay them for working. Well, no, the, the, before they paid this, there has to be a sign from the employer as to the circumstances in which he left work. You know, it can't be that through his own accord... It doesn't matter, he's still getting different. more money. I, I, I think it would be wrong if I was made redundant tomorrow. Yeah. If I then got twice as much money off the state as Red Rose Radio is prepared to give to me. It it's only lasts a, for a certain length of time. Well, however long, it lasts, it's, however long it lasts, it's hardly 
encouragement to go to work and let's face it if you're half it then you're just coming back to where you started if someone was earning let's say someone was earning five thousand pounds a year yeah and they got the sack they then go on to ten thousand pounds a year for a period of time and then it's half back down to five thousand in yeah. other words they're working they're working for five thousand well they can get ten thousand for a few months or maybe a year and then get 5,000 for the rest of the time. That strikes me as being a totally ludicrous yeah, policy. Yeah, but it, after that it decreases dramatically. So they, well, in it still other strikes ways, they have to get back out to work. Depending but, on the time scale, it strikes me as being ludicrous. But yes, of course, this country is behind other countries if you yeah. take isolated benefits. OK? It is. Cheers. OK, thank Bye -bye you. Now. Alu, Daniel. Uh, to remedy the point that uh, if you're thick and you've got brass, you can get into private schools, I think that private schools should hold entrance exams so that will sift out the wheat from the chaff, if you like. Well, some of them do hold entrance I know exams. They do, but I think uh, you were saying that you could still get in, but I think they all they should all have entrance exams to get in. Fine. So would you agree with uh, private ed education is a good system, then? If, if I would never agree that it is a good system, because it isn't a system. It's like the cure at egg, good in parts. Yes, but... Um, it's, an, it's not a system. If you haven't got brass, you can still get on the assisted places scheme. You might be able to, not you can. Yes, but if you still, you've still got hope... I you? don't... I, <laughs> I don't think hope is the right phrase. It is still possible. Hope still, is yeah. not the right phrase. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't want to go to a public school or some other independent school. Why not? Because I don't want to go to somewhere that teaches you that one individual is better than another. Oh, that, don't be course. silly. They teach you elitism at public school. Don't try and tell well, me they we don't. They help us run our country. Well, I'm telling you, a few seconds ago you said to me they don't. Now you're telling me why they do. Which of those statements is correct? Either they do or they don't. Which one? Uh, well... Which one? They don't, not really. Oh, they don't, not really. Not really means they do. When you say not really, I, the answer is yes or no. There's no not really crap. It's not drummed into you. I'm not interested in whether it's drummed into you. I said they teach you elitism. Are you totally bloody stupid? No, I'm not. Then you behave as if you are, you cretinous dog. How do Andy? Hello, Alan. It's Andy. I know. That's why you responded when I said, how do Andy? Thank you for showing your intellect. How do Don? Hello, Alan. You've just deafened me. Pardon? Uh, I want to take you to task about something. Uh, the other night, somebody was on about baseball, American baseball. And you said, uh, anyone who stands there with a bat and it's a ball must be daft or something. Some are similar to that. This is so. And then you were advertising last night that you are going playing cricket tonight. Everybody knows I'm daft. Well, that's a good point, yeah. Another thing, you know how you always challenge everybody when they say yes when you say hello, whoever. Well, you did it tonight as well. I know. Oh. And is it not a terribly lonely life being right all the time? No. Isn't it? No. Oh. Hey, and you did very well with that manic depressive that was on last week. Unusual for you, very considerate. <laughs> um, uh, I was glad I was listening to you that night. That's what's called a backhanded compliment. Uh, <laughs> Unusual no, well, for you, very considerate. Thanks very much. Uh, I know exactly uh, what you mean, Don. Cheers. Uh, Bye-bye uh, now. Yes, Why well, have you got me another one? What's the matter with you, artist? Are you trying to make me work over time? I'll do, John. Oh, hello, uh, hello, Alan. Um... I, I, I listen regularly to your programme, and I've rang it once before and had a polite conversation with you. Uh, and I want to know, is it fair to refer to me as a cretin just because I live on Merseyside? You said all Scousers are cretin. If I live on I Merseyside, it, I'm a Scouser. I think it's totally and utterly fair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good night. You think? Good night. It's as fair as it gets on this programme. Okay. All right, mate. Bye. <laughs> Another Scouser got a cob on. Looking for something different this week? Come along to the spectacular Superdome at Morecambe's Leisure Park and see the stars in concert. Frank Carson, Derek Beatty, plus many, many more. There's always something different at the Superdome Morecambe. Phone our leisure line on Morecambe 424444 and find out who and what's on this week. 
The Great Red Rose Radio charity Nutty Night Out is at the Gin, that's Gin Square Blackpool, on Thursday, July the 23rd. Come along and challenge our presenters on the pool table, throw darts at Alan Bezik's photo, and have a go at the crazy games and competitions. We start at 8, and the evening is one of our 7-Up party nights. There are plenty of 7-Up and Thwaites goodies to be won as well, and the whole night is in aid of the Winged Fellowship Trust, the charity which provides holidays for handicapped people in Lancashire. So don't forget the Red Rose Nutty Night Out at the Gin in Blackpool on Thursday, July the 23rd. Oh, what an atmosphere. I love a party with Alan Bessie. Very nearly time for me to go. So we'll have a bit of this. Wash your dirty faces. be back with you tonight at 10. Thank you to all our callers and even to Rod for taking the calls. Derek Webster's with you next. So till tomorrow night at 10, ta-ra. Have a grand night. The Two O'Clock News, this is Bill Bingham. A seven-year-old girl diagnosed as a sex abuse victim by the doctor at the centre of the Cleveland child row is back with her parents after they got a second opinion. The decision of Dr Marietta Higgs was overruled when the parents refused to accept it and called in a police surgeon and a paediatrician. Linda Duffin reports. The little girl was examined for signs of abuse without her mother's permission after going for a routine hospital checkup. The child could now be in council care, but for new guidelines which came into force that day. They gave the right to a second opinion, which quashed Dr Higgs' verdict. Middlesbrough MP Stuart Bell says it was a disgraceful episode. I am very concerned that a child, a small child, has been held in hospital for eight hours. And I am telephoning all the details of the case to the Minister of Health. The girl's parents are now seeking legal advice. British Guards officer Simon Haywood will today be formally charged with smuggling half a million pounds worth of cannabis into Sweden. Captain Hayward, who has always protested his innocence, has been held in solitary confinement since January, when more than £100 of the drug was found in his Jaguar car. His case has been taken up by Tory MP John Gorst, who's visited him in jail. He says the Swedes are determined to convict Hayward. I think they have determined that he's guilty. What they are primarily concerned with is rehearsing the evidence in public, putting it on record, if you like, and deciding what the sentence should be. You seem to be suggesting that it's all a foregone conclusion and that he won't have a fair trial. I am saying exactly that. Mrs Thatcher will tell President Reagan to his face today, stop being sidetracked by the Irangate scandal and get a grip on your role as a world leader. She'll deliver her message while she's on a flying visit to Washington. And he'll ask her for Britain to play a larger part in protecting the West's vital oil lifeline in the Gulf. Judith Dawson reports. Apart from their close personal chat, they'll be discussing arms control, and Mrs Thatcher will do her best to encourage Mr Reagan to exercise his undoubted muscle in talks with the Soviets, despite his difficulties at home. And for his part, the American president will lean on the Prime Minister to take a more active role in the tense Gulf region, asking her to come in with the US to protect oil shipping through the war zone. And she'll give her wholehearted support to any new peace initiative. Judith Dawson, IRN, Westminster. Chancellor Nigel Lawson is insisting there'll be no government U-turn on promises not to extend VAT to food, children's clothes, newspapers and books. 
He says Mrs Thatcher will veto common market proposals to increase the range of the sales tax. He says they have no intention of giving in to EEC pressure. For these proposals to get anywhere, there has to be unanimous agreement. And we've made it absolutely clear that we will not give our agreement to anything which conflicts with the pledges we've given. I think uh, either whether you call it a red herring or a dead duck, I'm not sure which animal you wish to choose. Independent Radio News. Nightline with Derek Webster.